Good morning, church. It's always a privilege and an honor when we get to come together and worship God together. Amen? Amen. And so uh, today, for the next 25 or so minutes, I'd like to talk, talk to you about redefining success. Remember a few weeks ago at the start of the year, we talked about a new year, a new attitude towards success. But today I want us to look at redefining success because I believe, as we'll see for many of us, success has different meanings. And it's very important for us to understand God's meaning of success. So before we start, let's go before God in prayer. Righteous God and Heavenly Father, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you alone are God. And I thank you so much, Father, for your mercy and your grace upon each and every one of our lives today. It's such a privilege to come before you, to honor you, to lift up praises and glory to you, Father, because you're indeed worthy. And as we prepare to listen to the message, Lord God, that you have prepared in advance for us, I pray that your spirit will be with me. I pray, Lord God, that you help me to Allow the Spirit to work through me. Please let the message go, out, Father, with, with clarity and with power and with authority to do the work that you have designed it to do in my life and in each and every life here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Redefining success. Let me put on my glasses. I don't see so good without them. There was a time when I, you know, I refused. But no, I've lost that battle. What does success mean to you? I'm sure if I was to pass a mic around to each and every one of us, chances are we'll all have a different definition for success. But it's important for us to understand it. You know, Buzz Aldrin, who knows who Buzz Aldrin is? Okay, a few of you. Second man to set foot on the moon. Yeah. And so uh, Buzz Aldrin, he, he, uh, he went on the moon, you know, very uh, amazing. And they did an interview with him a few years ago. And during the interview, he shared how after all that, he suffered very badly with depression. And they asked, why is that? Because you think after such a feat, you know, with all the, the, the prestige and the glamour that comes with some, this guy's like a living legend. And he said the only thing that he could think or that he thought happened is that in preparing for this mission, he gave his all to it. That for years, that was all that he focused on. Preparing for the mission, learning how to, to fly, you know, to, to maneuver the rocket and knowing what to do when they land on the moon. That was the only thing that he focused on in life. And so the mission happened, he landed on the moon, it was fantastic, and then he had to come back to earth. And then when he came back to earth, it hit him that would, there was nothing for him to look forward to because he spent all his time and his energy focusing on this, this one thing. There was not, it's like there was no hope for him and it just broke him. And I believe what happened to, to Buzz is, is it's not unique to him alone. But it impacts a lot of us today, even in the church. Because for many of us, you know, we give our all into different endeavors and projects, and we have high expectations for these projects. And when it doesn't happen, when things doesn't pan out as we expect, it hit us hard. 
And for a lot of people, that they don't know how to deal with it. Because their entire, their being, their entire self-worth, their self-image, their identity is tied up into these accomplishments. And when it fails, whether it be a, a, a business deal that went south or an investment that you have, you know, for your hours, for your retirement and the market crash and you lose everything, or whether it be a, a, a relationship, you know, with that guy or girl that you think that he's the one. And then only to find out afterwards that he's more like the evil one. It hits people hard. And a lot of people don't know how to deal with it. And so it's very important for us to understand because for these people, success is tied to their academic or their, their career, their secular or you know, social achievement, success is tied to it. But you know, uh, what's her name? Emily Smith wrote an interesting article last year that's saying that no, because that's the, that was a thought for a long time. Even growing up for me back in Jamaica, success was tied to your academic achievement. If you went to school and you did not graduate with subject, you'd be looked upon as worthless. Right? You know, good for nothing. Nothing happened for you and it's like you're a failure. But psychologists are now looking and telling people that it's a bad idea to tie your self-worth, your, your, your self-image, your identity to academic or secular accomplishments. Because life is a lot more than that. They're learning now what God has told us a long time ago. And so it's very important for us to understand what is the true meaning of success. And it's very important why? Because however we define success in our lives, that's what we're going to spend our energy and our time and put into. I want to make sure that we get it right. Amen? Amen? So what is true success? You know, Paul gave us an idea in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Sorry. And it reads, because here in the Corinthian church, they were having some similar issues. After starting on faith, standing firm in the gospel that saved them, they, they lost track. They started to stray from what they first believed. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, he says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So here in this passage, Paul's given an idea of what's the true meaning of success. So simply put, he's saying true success in life is tightly coupled with a meaningful relationship with God. It's not to your, tied to your secular accomplishments or your academic accomplishments. It has nothing to do with the university you went to, you, you attended. But it, it's closely tied to a relationship with God. That if you have a relationship with God, you will lead a meaningful life. You will lead a successful life. You will lead a life of fulfillment. You will not leave feeling empty. And so, it's very important that if you don't get anything from the lesson here today, I think God wants you to get this. Do not spend your time on any endeavor or projects that value is only in this life. And I'll say it again. If you don't get anything from the message today, God wants you to understand this. Do not spend your effort and your energy on any project or endeavor that value is only in this life. Because that will not be of benefit to you. 
Because everything in this life, the things that we go after, and education, relationships, money, we cannot take with us. And when God talks about our life in the scriptures, when God looks at us and he's interested in our success, amen? He's interested in our life. And when God talks about our life in the scriptures, he's talking about our future state. He's not talking about just this life. Because this life, everything about this life is temporary and it's passing. So God said, everything that you do, do it with your future state in mind. Your life with God eternally. So do things that has a value, not just for this life, but the life to come. Amen? Amen. And so Paul is here saying that if we want to lead a life of success, of true success, a meaningful life, where the things that we do is not in vain, that we got to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. What does that mean? Giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord. It basically means doing what the things that God requires each and every one of us to do. It means doing what God created us to do. And when we do that, when we give ourselves that way, we will lead a successful life we'll come to understand what it truly means to be successful. And so in this passage today, I want to look at if we are going to lead a life that truly reflects the success that God created us for us to live. If we're going to lead a life that is, that truly embraces the things that God wants us to do. There are four things from this passage that we must do. And the first thing is this. We must honor God we must honor God here Paul says the object of this passage Paul says is we need to live live for the Lord do the things the Lord call us to the very first thing is we gotta honor God what does it mean to honor God it means to love God with all your heart anything that you honor you hold in a high regard amen it's important to you. You know, you see Layla there in, in the crowd. She's held up. You know, she's important. Anything you hold in a high regard is something that you honor. And to honor God means to love him, to give him your best in everything that you do, to give him your all. It's the very first commandment in scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, where it says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, soul, and strength. When we are giving God our all, when we are loving him with every fiber of our being, we are honoring God. You know, David was a man who honored God. The Bible described David as a man after God's own heart. And one of the reasons for that is you see David showed his love for God in in some tangible ways that we can learn from today. The book of Psalms, 150 chapters, I think, in the book of Psalms. And approximately half of it has been written by David. These are Psalms with prayers, you know, praying to God. Psalms with songs, singing to God, you know, glorifying him saying just how wonderful and how majestic and how awesome he is. Psalms of poems. Praising God. And David was able to do this because David recognized in his life the importance of God. That God does exist. That God has been working. As a matter of fact, he attributed his success in life to God. When he went to fight Goliath, you know, a famous story, he told, he told Saul that, listen, God saved me from the power of the lion and the bear. He didn't say, oh, I did it. It was my skill and my swiftness. He recognized that that's a battle that no man can win. It had nothing to do with me. That was just all God. And so he, he accredited his success there to God. And he never forget it. 
You know, I think for many of us, we know, we have heard it, you know, that we love God. And we say, yes, you know, I love God. You know, that's why I'm here at church. But are we truly loving God? Are we truly being like David? You know, where we, we think about his commandments. You know, it is his strong desire to, to fulfill everything that God wants him to do. Think about it this morning because it's very important. Because love your, you honoring God gives everything else that you do meaning in life. Think about the object of your, your life right now, your eyes. You know, I, one of the things that can help me measure if I'm truly loving God, I measure the things I do like for my wife compared to what I'm giving God. I remember when I, I, I met my wife, I, I couldn't wait to see her. I'm at work and I'm thinking about her. I'm wondering, does she have lunch? And sometimes, even without knowing, I'll make sure I'll go and buy lunch and I'll take it for her. You know, I love to hear her speak. I want to hear her, her voice. You know, I wouldn't say anything. You know, it kind of hides my selfishness because I didn't talk much. But I wanted to hear. I wanted to spend time with her. And it's the same with God. Do we have those feelings for God? Do we, do we desire to spend time with him just to think about all that he has done in our lives from the time that we're conceived till this very day? Do we think about all the blessings that he has showered on us? And do we praise him for it? No matter what's happening in our lives, do we say, yes, you know what? The same God that works for me in the dark, in the good times is also there in the dark times. Yeah, sure. Do we honor him that way? You know, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, 16 to 22, it gives a, a, a vision of just the, the, the depth of David's love for God. 2 Samuel 16, 2 Samuel chapter 6, 16 to 22. Here we see David. Taking the ark into Jerusalem. And this ark is pretty much representative of God being with Israel. And it's here the scripture says, As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from the window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, it says she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. He's grateful. He's thankful. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread and a cake of dates, and a cake of dates and a cake of raisin to each person in the whole crowd of the Israelites, both men and women, and to all the, and all the people went home. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him with attitude and said. How the king of Israel distinguished himself today. This robing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. And David said to Michal, It is before the Lord. Who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. And this is the, the, the key part. David said, listen, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I'll be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I'll be held in honor. David's worship and honor and praise of God wasn't subdued. 
He wasn't afraid of lifting his hands in worship. He wasn't afraid of dancing and his clothes falling off because he was so grateful. There is nothing more important to him than honoring God. What holds that place in your life this morning? Who are we honoring like this this morning? Because if we are going to truly lead lives that reflect the success, the purpose that God calls us to, it's very important that we learn to honor God. Amen? Very first and important thing, that we honor God. When we honor God, we give him our best in everything. We give him our best in our thoughts. We give him our best in our prayers. We don't fall asleep before him when we're praying. You know, we, we spend special time with him. When we honor God, we also don't give him, we give him the best, not the bare minimum. You know, sometimes we, we think about honoring God and we, you know, we, we don't have a quiet time in the morning, but we have it at the end of the day. I was tired. It was a late night. And even though you're doing it, that's not your best. It's not honoring. How do we know if we're giving bare minimum or we're giving our best? You see, when you're giving your bare minimum, nobody becomes successful giving their bare minimum in nothing at all in life. If you're in, if you're in college or university and you give your bare minimum to study, I, I think you know the grade you're going to get. If you're at the workplace and you give your bare minimum, I, don't, I guarantee you're not going to be there very long. Because employers want people who are proactive. And so how do you know if you're giving just bare minimum to God? One of the things that you could look at is, that can tell is, you know, coming to worship on a Sunday. We come at the start. Rather than come a little bit early to see, you know, how can I help? Who can I encourage? You know you're giving bare minimum when with there are things to do and you often have to get tapped on the shoulder to help. Because you're not looking, as the scripture says, to, to think in advance so we can encourage. Let's give God our best, Amen. amen. If we're going to lead the successful lives, that life's pleasing to God, we've got to honor him. And the second thing we need to do, we need to obey him. We need to obey him. We need to obey God in all circumstances. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, it gives you an idea of just how important obedience is to God. And it says... In verse 22. And this is here God sent Saul on a mission. And Saul did only partially what God asked him to. And he was very comfortable with it. And this is what God ha had to say in verse 22 of 1 Samuel 15. It says, But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord? And this is from the New Living Translation. Your burnt offerings and sacrifices are your obedience to his voice. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Obedience is very, very important to God. And one of the things that you see from this passage is that partial obedience is disobedience. You know, a lot of times, I'll do this much, but then I'll leave a little bit, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, it's not so bad. But it's not a good attitude to embrace, because in God's eyes, partial obedience is disobedience. And there's the reason why obedience is so important to God, because it reveals two things. It reveals your love for him to do exactly what he says. When you love somebody, you don't hurt them. You, you, things that they tell you that's important to them, you want to do it all the time. 
not just sometime. It reveals your love and it reveals your faithfulness. How, imp how obedient are we to God's word this morning? I know the fact that each and every one of us is here, that we have a desire to praise God. We want to glorify him. But how obedient are you in obeying God's word fully? Is it something that you think about all the time? Or you think, you know what? Everyone around me is doing the same thing, so it's not so bad. God is looking. He looks at it. We need to give our all in our obedience. Amen? Amen? David diligently obeyed God, not just sometimes when times are good, but he did it even when times are bad. We see that in 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 8 to 11, he is there running from Saul for his life. Now, I guarantee you, if, if my life is being threatened, I'm not sure how obedient I'm going to be. When I meet upon the person threatening me. And in verse 8 of 1 Samuel chapter 26. Here we see David meeting upon his enemy. The guy that's chasing him around the country to, to kill him. And David said. Don't kill Saul. He basically told his, the, the men, do not kill him. Do not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Because either his time will come or he'll die in battle. So even in life and death situation, David's conviction was, you know what? I'm going to honor God. God doesn't want me to do this. Even the way I may feel it, but this is not what God wants me to do. Is that our conviction as we come before God every single day? Every single day that God bless us with, is that our conviction? You know, some things that we can practice to help us with our obedience is this, to spend time in God's word every morning. Know what he requires. Because if we don't know what God requires, we can't do it. But when we know what God requires, it shows that we are interested in the things that God wants us to do. It shows love. It shows honor. It shows our obedience. And it shows that we want to do even more for God. You know, in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, it says, The eyes of the Lord search a whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is always looking for faithful men and women that he can use. You want to be used by God like, by, like David? You want to be used by God like Abraham? Let's be obedient, fully obedient to God, amen? I know this morning... You may be thinking, you know what? I know this is something that I need to do. I've known it a long time, but you know, I've got this situation in my life that is just really challenging. And as soon as I'm done with it, then I'll be able to do all that God wants me to, to, to do. I'll be able to honor him. I'll be able to, to give him my all in obedience. But God is saying this morning, just obey. Give me something that I can work with. Show your love, show your, your, your trust in me, your faithfulness, and I'll do the rest. So if we're going to lead lives that truly reflect success, we've got to honor God, we've got to obey God, and the third thing, third thing that we need to do, we need to labor wholeheartedly for God. We need to labor wholeheartedly for God, not ourselves. You know, David was a man who labored for God. The scriptures teach in 1 Samuel 25 verse, verse 28, and I'll read. This is Abigail in her meeting David. David wasn't doing so well at that point in time. And she went and she, she met him on his journey. 
to go fight a battle that really he shouldn't. And she said to him, please give me, forgive me if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with a lasting dynasty for you fight the Lord's battles. The thing about David's obedience, the, the thing about David's laboring for God is this. He didn't just talk about it. It was evident in his life. People saw it. They knew it. It was very clear. Even God himself in 2 Samuel chapter 7 said, when he sent the prophet to David, he said, go tell my servant David. If God was supposed to speak to us this morning, would he use the same phrase? Would he, would he call us his servants? Because of just how much we're laboring for him? I believe every single one of us here, we, we're laboring. We all working. But are we all working for the Lord? Are we all working for God? If we are going to truly be an example of the life that God calls each and every man to live, we, we got to honor him. We got to obey him and we got to labor. There's much work to do. But we gotta be willing to give ourselves to the work, amen. You know, for me it's oftentimes, you know, I know I need to work, I know I need to labor, but my schedule is full. I labor at work, and by the time I finish work, I don't have much strength left to do anything else. But I think about it. I'll even pray about laboring. I'll talk about it. We'll make plans about it. But sometimes we can do that and never really get to the point of laboring. Never get to the point of doing the work. There's a work that God wants to do here in Ottawa, amen? And he's looking for faithful men and women to do it. People who will make themselves available. People who are willing to labor, to give themselves fully to the work of the Lord. There's no other way it's going to be done. It's either God's going to use you or he's going to use someone else. I'd rather him use you and me. Amen? Let us give ourselves fully to, the, to laboring for God. Who are you laboring for this morning? What is it that's consuming your time, consuming your thoughts, consuming your energy? And ask yourself, does it have value beyond this life? Because if it doesn't, you shouldn't be spending your time on it. You know, in Psalms 127, verse 1 to 2, God says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builder labors in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guard stands watch in vain. Basically, what does that mean? If we're not giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, we're laboring in vain because God's not pleased. But when we give ourselves fully, when we honor God, when we obey him, when we labor for him, what the scripture says. In Psalm 121 verse 3 says, he will not allow your foot to slip. He, he who keeps you will not slumber. It says God watches over you when you give yourself fully to him. And so let's make a decision to give ourselves fully to God, amen? Not partially, not three quarters, not 90%. Because God's got a plan for each and every one of our lives. And the church will not grow. The church, the things that you desire to see, you know, the growth that you want to see take place will not happen until each and every one of us come to the conviction that our single purpose in life is to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. 
to nothing else. Does it mean that you don't work? That's not what it means. But it means even while you're at work, you're looking for opportunities to advance God's kingdom, to bring men into God's kingdom. When you're at home, you're looking for those opportunities to impact a neighbor for Christ, to help them to truly understand what true success is, that it's not in the amount of toys that you have. It's not in the friends that you have. It's not in the social connections that you have. Because there's no hope for those beyond this life. But it's in giving your life fully to God. In honoring the one in whose hands is your life and all your ways. And so let's honor God. Let's obey him. Let's labor for him. Amen. And the final point. That if we are going to lead lives that truly reflect God's will for us, true success, we've got to yield our lives to God. So we need to honor him, we need to obey him, we need to labor for him, and we need to yield our lives to God. In 2 Samuel 16, verse 11 to 13, it says, and just to give a little bit of context, this is David in the later years of his life. Because of something that he, he did, you know, his, his son was after him to take his life. His son pulled a coup and he was running for his life. And someone from Saul's clan who was the previous king, who despised David because for whatever reason, maybe he despised the fact that you know, the, the, the kingship has now moved from his clan to, this, to, to Judah. Or that men, you know, despise the fact that David and his men killed a lot of Saul's men. But while they ran, this is what happened in Second Samuel chapter 16, verse 11 to 13. It says, Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, because while he was running, what happened? This, this Shimei from Saul's clan was throwing stones on David and showing him with dirt and cursing him and, you know, basically saying, good for you. And David's bodyguard was like, who's this man? This is the king. Let me go cut off his head. And David's response was to Abishai and to all his servants. He says, my own son is trying to kill me. Doesn't this relative of Saul have even more reason to do so? Leave him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord has told him to do it. And perhaps the Lord will see that I'm being wronged and will bless me because of these curses today. So David and his men continued. What humility. What surrender. That was not easy to do. I can't see myself if somebody's stoning me. Say, so leave him alone. Let him stone some more. But David, in David's mind, David understood that, you know what? God is my shield and God is my protector. I'm not going to attack him because he's attacking me. You know, maybe God did tell him to do it. So, you know what? I'm going to humble myself. You know, sometimes we have some situations that attack us in life. You know, you make plans and you, you just can't seem to get a break. You know, you're trying to build some relationships and it just can't seem to flourish. Maybe you're trying to move ahead with your life and it, you know, it just, things just not panning out as planned. And oftentimes what we try is to fight some more and, and we, we look for somebody to blame and to point a finger and we get resentful and, and, we have, and we get angry and we have attitude in our hearts. But God is saying, yield. Why David was such a successful king because he understood that the blessings of God came when you fully surrendered. And he fully surrendered his life. And if each and every one of us here today 
with our convictions, with our pride, with our beliefs, would embrace the same attitude as David did to surrender, to yield our lives to God. Believe me, you, your mind can't, would not be able to imagine the work that God would be able to do through the Ottawa church. If we just yield, if each and every one of us just yield our lives. I don't find yielding very easy. For me, yielding is very challenging. Because when somebody does something to me, my first reaction is to react. I want to defend myself. I want to respond. And every time that I do that, I end up sinning. But every time I do that, it stops God from working in my life. Because maybe God put that situation there to mold something in my character. But I keep fighting it. What about you this morning? Are you yielding to God's working in your life? Are you fighting it? Let's make a decision this morning to yield to God. Amen? Because God wanted to do great things in our lives. You see, success has nothing to do with the things that we acquire in this life. It has nothing to do with our, our academic or our secular achievements. It has nothing to do with that. But what you see from scriptures is that success has everything to do with leading a life that is surrendered completely to God. A life that's given to doing the work of God. That that is our focus and nothing else. And there are many lives out there that have been adversely impacted because their, their idea of success is tied to some accomplishment in this life. And so they don't come to God, they don't surrender to God because their self-worth is in these things. It's in a, in a career, you know, in a relationship or something like this. And they have been adversely impacted by it. But if we only... Do as Paul says. If we make a decision today, as a church, as, as friends, seeking God to honor him with our lives. Not seek to honor ourselves or seek honor for ourselves. If we make a decision to obey him completely, even when you can't see how it's going to be beneficial to you, but just trust him. To obey him completely. To labor for him. To give yourself fully to doing his work. To think about how you can help and how you can inspire and encourage. And look for different areas within, within the, the, the fellowship or within the lives of those around you. That you can labor and, and extend God's work in Ottawa. And if we yield ourselves to him. Then you'll find that we truly lead lives that reflect the success that God designed us to have. Amen? Amen.